I'm just going to expose um, witches, witchcraft and astral projection. Uh, I learned how to do it when I was in the Rosicrucians. I did it for a little bit. It was uh, that real that it scared me that I wasn't going to know if I was, you know, in my physical form or the astral form and I stopped it for a while. And uh, then I started it and got another scare and then I got saved, so got out of it, but I know it's real, I know it exists. You know, this. it says in Ephesians 6.12, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rules of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So it's the spiritual wickedness in high places, which is the second heaven, the uh, dimensional realm where Satan was cast into when he was banished from heaven, the third heavens, God and his throne and and then the first heavens, the clouds, the air and then and the stars and the moon and the second heavens, the other dimension. It's all around us but we can't see it and that's the realm of the devil. That's where you operate in when you when your ass will project you can't be seen. So these human spirits are a worry and it's it's absolutely increasing and uh, with all the witchcraft, the books, the movies, the videos, all encouraging, all this sort of thing, it's it's got to be exposed, so that's what I'm doing, uh, and especially because the church is either doing this or they're doing this, you know, and uh, it's pretty bad when they, they're perishing for lack of knowledge, as, as uh, 4 6 says, and if they reject the knowledge, then God will reject them. And anyway, this is what's going on. In the book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon speaks of the silver cord that's loosed at the time of death. And that, that silver cord connects the body to the soul when you're in the astral plane and even in life. The, the ones that are teaching it, as I said, I was in the Rosicrucians, notice the wings. The wings on logos mean that they're in the game usually. Uh... There's Buddhism, Hinduism, the Golden Dawn, OTO, Voodoo, Scientologists, they all teach it. Look at this, this Scientologist Superman has got, as Scientologist Superman, as um, Satan said in the garden, you two shall become as gods. Once they think they can do this and they're hidden and they can go around doing whatever they like, affecting people's dreams and, you know, steal kill and destroy morals just totally disintegrate if you had morals before you started well they're gonna go and that's what satan wants they they are uh, start getting filled up with demons and they lose themselves their selves disappear and the demons start taking over their mind body soul and spirit and that's the plan and lead lead people to destruction they know the soul exists eternally and uh, but so they choose to believe in reincarnation rather than eternal judgment, eternal life or damnation. But the ones who know who they're really serving, they're told that they're going to be leaders and high up in the kingdom of hell. These are usually being so infested with demonic spirits that they're reprobate, they're no longer even themselves, they're just walking demons. When I was in the Rosicrucian, they gave me a sketch and it was like a castle, it was called the Celestial Sanctum, they said, go, we meet here. Anyway, this is an example, this is sort of what it looked like, this is what come into my mind when I seen the picture. Funny enough, you know, he's in the game here, and with all the stuff that this mob's teaching. They're pushing it on the kids and the kids, they're opening up doorways and uh, it's all happening, going to get a lot, lot worse. So you've got to be switched on and know what's going on. But God can protect. I've got a lot of stuff on God's protection here too. And I want to thank the people that are, these interviews that are coming and the interviewees the, those who are hosted these people i want to thank them they're in the battle uh th thank you so much for um being in the battle and thank you for uh, uncovering the darkness and yeah praise god so first of all we'll go to the kampala museum in uganda where the uh about 
a quarter to a third of the displays are all about witchcraft and uh, witchcraft heroes, witchcraft rituals, witchcraft objects. And so we start off, this was one of the heroes fighting in the war in Uganda. This is how we defeated the enemy through astral projection and uh, throwing spears and curses from the second heaven onto the physical enemies. And in this corner we are seeing Chibuka, God of War, by Baganda. It was believed by Baganda to be, this man was believed by Baganda to be God of War. This man had the ability to fly to the sky and could fight people aiming from the sky. This man could start from this point, could do some rituals in this spot. After doing some rituals, he could climb the tree to the leaves. From the leaves, could just disappear mysteriously to the sky and he could fight as illustrated there. I'm saying this fella, he do his ritual in the pot there. Uh -huh. He'd end up climbing up the tree, floating up the tree, mm. and taking off astral projection, and then, and then throwing his spears yeah. down. And during those times, Buganda was rivals with Bunyoro, so they could fight a lot within those kingdoms. So this man could fight on the side of Buganda, fighting Banyoro, all Banyoro kingdom. All these people that I've got, the testimonies and that, they're just parts of the whole testimony. Go and look these people up and listen to them. You'll gain so much knowledge and understanding and wisdom that you need in these final days to fight the battle, to stand strong and not, you know, come under the oppression and the attacks that the enemy's going to put on you or try to put on you. So, yeah, I encourage you to do that. The next one's Bill Sneblin explaining astral travel, astral projection. He was a, a uh, high-level Satanist and a, in the Illuminati, and he'd been into a lot of stuff, and he could astral project, and he explains it pretty well. Yeah, we, we might laugh at, uh, you know, the, the broomstick, but what about uh, astral projection? Mm -hmm. uh, is that real? What is astral projection? I believe it is real. Uh, and what it is is basically the idea of being able to leave your body, to have your soul go out of your body. And if this is an occult practice, although like everything in the occult, there are biblical analogs. We see, you know, like, for example, the Holy Spirit, I believe, can take like a prophet or an apostle you know, such as John the Revelator. You know, he says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day in Revelation 1. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I think the Spirit took him out of his body so that he could see all of these bizarre visions that are part of the book of Revelation. Well, in the same way, you know, the devil can help you. And I, I used to teach people how to do this. I was very good at asking projection. You, you leave your body, you let your body either sit there or lay there, and the soul leaves the body and goes out and does things. I mean, you can go spy on people, you can, you can visit people. I actually used to go and watch movies. Watch in movies? My astral body. Really? Like in a drive-in? No, I mean in a real theater. You wow. know, the only bummer was I couldn't eat any popcorn because I was eating <laughs> kind of this phantom sort of thing. Now, were you, uh, were you hovering you over? Or sitting in a seat. Were you afraid people might sit on me? I was hovering over. <laughs> wow. I know that sounds kind of weird, but, you know, you got to understand, people, if you, if you study the Bible, you realize the soul is more or less the same shape as the body, except it's incorporeal. You know, the way I explain it is this. The body, think of it like a football, okay? The body and soul and spirit is like a football. The, the leather... I hate to say it, the pig skin of the football is like your body. The soul is like the, the rubber bladder inside of the football. It's the same shape as the football. The, your spirit is like the air inside of the football. It gives the football its life and its shape. That's the body, soul, spirit. And, you know, in the occult and spiritualism and witchcraft and so on, it is believed that you can leave your body, and I believe this is a real demonic thing that happens, and you can go and spy on it. Because many times people will say to me, you know, I ran into this witch on the bus and I tried to witness to them, 
And then that night in my bedroom, the same witch showed up in my bedroom and tried to scare me to death. Wow. Materialized and, there in the in your view? Pardon me? I mean, you, she, she actually uh, she materialized there, just like a person would walk into a room. Yeah, except you, you look kind of, you can like see through them. It's, it's kind of like what you see in, in TV and movies. You know, it's like kind of a ghostly phantom type form. Yes. That takes a tremendous amount of occult power to do that. Okay, that's a good normally, question. Normally, if you're actually projecting, you're invisible into normal people. But uh, the past had brought her along to my place. And uh, uh, her appearance was like the, the witch from Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. She had a hooked chin and a hooked nose. She was about 35 years of age and her face just reflected terrible darkness. Now you would have seen people like this. They are to be pitied. And all she knew in all her life was evil and hatred. And she belonged to the local witches' coven, and most suburbs have got them. And uh, they had decided that uh, since we were making waves, spiritual waves in uh, Devonport, and you know, when you send all these demons off, uh, they go and report to their boss <laughs> and say, the Jewish are at it again, you know, look, I've been dispossessed of my house. <laughs> And, and, and all this sort of thing. And so uh, the local warlocks said, all right, well, we've got to uh, all psych ourselves up and uh, we'll meditate for the whole day and then we will astral project with all of our demonic friends and uh, we'll go and attack the Jewets. And so this is what she told me happened. They all meditated all day and they came out of their bodies, leaving them in a trance at home. Uh, which is very convenient, isn't it? Off they set with this swarm of demons to uh, our street address. And when they got there, uh, they had the fright of their lives because the place was surrounded with angelic warriors, you know, about 30 foot tall or something like that, and they were absolutely terrorised. And they fled in all directions and in disarray, and the local warlock had a nervous breakdown and left the district... <laughs> And this girl recognised that there was an almighty power of which she'd never heard or seen of in all of her life. And so she sought out the pastor and said, what do I have to do to get on the right side of the tracks? And so he led her to Christ. But she came to the door and he was trying to push her in and she was looking all around, uh, wondering whether there were any of these great angelic warriors and she had one hand on, her, on the doorpost and he's pushing from behind trying to get her into the house. Well, she finally came in after I bound the powers of darkness. And the problem with this witch uh, was the same as uh, this manic depressive lady and that is that she had been experienced tremendous rejection as a child. Mothers with broken hearts always have children with broken hearts because they are unable to be bonded to their children. You know, you may think, well, I can just get in, involved in witchcraft. It'll be fun. You know, my friends are doing it. I want to go on this astral projection trip that they're talking about. Uh, you know, I want to invite these things in, see what happens. And you know what? They may not wake up the next day, John. They may not wake uh, up the same night. <laughs> they may not wake up the same night because I, I, used to, I used to project myself to go to cursed neighborhoods, Brother Bruce. In, in my book, when you read it, I, I, will, I will leave my body home and I will actually project myself and I will fly into the air. I used to project myself the civil court and I would, because I was escorted by a demon that, 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 that would actually project me from different neighborhoods. So I can curse different neighborhoods and wow. I can put strongholds in those neighborhoods so, so the Santeria and the Espiritismo can get to those neighborhoods. By, by other other people that were practicing witchcraft, so they can be in bondage, and people will go to the local botanica, and which is a, which is which is a storefront of all demonic uh, ingredients and demonic uh, uh, paraphernalia and all that other stuff that go with it. So 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 I would fly into these neighborhoods because I was high ranked of a worshipper, and because the higher the, the higher you go into Santeria, the higher you go into Spiritismo and Palamanyumbe, the more trust the demons give you, and the more trust, the more relationship you have with them, and the more the, the more they give you to deal. 
and that's the way this religion works. And, 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 and one thing I wanted to say, the book that they give you in Santeria is called Enita. Enita, that's the name of the book, so people don't think that, well, he don't know the name of the book, or he's phony. No, the name of the book is your Ita. Your Ita is telling you your whole life, even to the point that they show, they even say in the book how you're going to die. I started to recruit people to the dark side. At the age of 13, 14, 15, I was already going to demon church. I was, already, I was knowing principality, demons. I was knowing colors. I was learning regions. I was learning how to map out situation. I was learning how to hate the church. I was learning how to put witchcraft on the church. So the church people were sleeping. I was up. So I was actually projecting into your neighborhood and locking down your neighborhood so you, you won't produce anything in your neighborhood while you were home sleeping. And then on Christmas time, the first week, the fir- the, on December, the first week, we had a big meeting every year. All the high-ranked devil worshippers would have a meeting that year. When you were at the mall shopping, we were doing witchcraft to shut you down. We didn't go to the mall. We were up at 3 in the morning doing witchcraft to the Christians. So when you were too busy hanging out with Santa Claus in the mall, I was putting stuff on you. I was locking down your region because I knew that everything starts in the spirit realm. And I will astral project and leave my body home and curse your neighborhoods. Because you were not praying for your neighborhoods. There were few Christians that would pray for the neighborhood. That when I would astral project and leave my body, I would astral project over the light pole. And I would end up in neighborhoods. And there was Christians. I knew they were Christian because they, they were in circle. And they, had, they would dress funny. Because Christians didn't know how to dress. They would dress funny. Long skirts and bun hair and no makeup. Listen, I did, as a devil worshiper, I drank animal blood. I kill more animals than you could never believe. I put witchcraft on people and they lost their mind. I gave people I was getting I was getting paid crazy money to give people abortions with witchcraft. I'm I'm tired just the way it is. I was giving people abortion to witchcraft for money. I would put witchcraft on people and break up marriages. I was actually projecting and end up in your house, in your marriage. I was in your house checking everything on your house, actually projecting in the spirit, checking everything in your house, and you didn't even know I was in your home. And then when they tell me, do witchcraft, I would turn into a wolf, I would turn into an animal, end up in your house, and give you a heart attack. See, because the devil knows how to play the game. He played for keeps. He played for keeps. So my, my, job was, my, my job was to torment and torment. I would lay hands. That's why I said, be careful. I would lay hands on churches and close them down. I would curse neighborhoods so salvation won't come into your neighborhood. You ever seen the TV? Let me, let me say something to you. you ever seen, when you watch the news, you see how the spirits transfer? You don't see how the spirit is transferred? What happened in Ferguson happened in Baltimore from Baltimore. That spirit is moving around. He's transferring. He's bringing division, discord, and he's bringing murder, spirit of murder, transfer from one place to another. Those are the devil worshiping people doing that. We're not stopping it. Those are real devil worship I used to hang out with. So they're taking that spirit, moving it from one place, say moving from Kansas City to Baltimore. From Baltimore, after it commits the murder and the crime there, and move it somewhere else. You can't catch up to it unless you know spiritual welfare. When we're speaking about the protection of God, God protects his own. He's protecting those who have come close to him, who are walking in repentance, covered in the blood, walking in forgiveness and humility. Not the, not the religious, not the lukewarm, not the ones playing games. They're deceived and deluded already. The devil doesn't have to attack them. So, so, but when these people are talking about they couldn't curse Christians. It's the true Christians, the real Christians, walking in holiness and righteousness. So there's a price to pay for your sin, and it could cost you a lot more than you think. Did you get any hints while you were doing magic that Christians have more power than white or black witches? Uh, I actually had very little. In fact, I, never, I really never met a true Christian while I was a witch. You know, so it was difficult for, for me to get that kind of a sense. The closest I think I would come would be the thing I mentioned earlier where he, where he tried to curse that woman who was a, the daughter of a Christian preacher and all the curses bounced back. At the time, we just didn't, I think the devil had so clouded my mind, I don't think I really got it. You know, I didn't, I, it didn't occur to me, well, gee, why is this, this measly woman able to turn aside all of these mighty curses? You know, that we, we threw every, every curse that we knew, some of the raunchiest, vilest curses in the book, and her nail just bounced off like, you know, you know, styrofoam balls off the armor-plated tank. And normally would something have stuck? Oh, yeah, normally, if we weren't doing it to a Christian, those things can, can kill people. I mean, some of those, I mean, like, for example, this fellow I mentioned earlier who was so evil in whose apartment I stayed in, I mean, he would do rituals on people that he didn't like, and they would have, like, you know, 
within 24 hours, they'd have centipedes clawing their way out of the person's stomach. Mm. I mean, that's the kind of thing you can do in voodoo. I mean, voodoo is incredibly powerful. But we use voodoo curses against this woman, and no effect. Having centipedes come out of your stomach might sound fairly extreme and impossible, but here's an experience that we had in while we were in North Uganda with a woman that was came under a witchcraft curse, and this was real. And the people of the village knew it, and they just treated it as no big thing. Amazing. G'day, Pete here. This is witchcraft in Uganda about a curse that we come across in the village of Otwool up north Uganda. And anyway, this woman came for prayer and she had cuts all over her. And I had an interpreter there and the interpreter wasn't very good at English. And they said that there was a... um, She's having pins and needles and razor blades come out of her body. And I... I thought that they meant that she was cutting herself with pins, needles and razor blades because she was covered in scratch, covered in cuts, covered in scars. And anyway, they explained that there was a cow died in the village and they, they called in a witch doctor. The witch doctor got a chicken, cut it in half long ways and pulled the guts and that out of it, filled it up with razor blades, pins and nails and then he, and then sewed it back up and said whoever's killed the cow, pins, needles and razor blades would come out of her, come out of them. And anyway, this woman's come up and she's, um, every morning she'd wake up and there'd be pins, needles and razor blades coming out and I had trouble believing it and I said, don't you mean she's cutting herself or, you know, I having trouble with the interpreter and I mean it was a small village everyone was related everyone knew each other and they said no this is what's happening pins needles and razor blades coming out of, coming out of us so we prayed for her and I seen her again uh, within five or six days and she was healed up the cuts and the scratches uh, the marks were healing up but anyway, she was complaining that there was a pin coming out of her high up in her inner thigh, and I didn't want to look there. I thought, you know, from what I'd seen in Africa, I, I could believe this stuff. And anyway, Eric, our friend, the pastor, the Ugandan, asked her, did you go back to the witch doctor? And she nodded her head, or a witch doctor, they loved going to the witch doctors. Anyway, she went back to the witch doctor. We prayed for him for five or six days. He asked her, did you have any trouble? She's going, no. And then he's going crook at her saying, why did you go back to the witch doctor then? And now the trouble started again. Why did you do it? She didn't. She put her head down. They all trust so much in the witch doctors because they can, you know, the church, we just opened the church. You know, they, they haven't got... They don't understand Jesus Christ or Christianity. They understand taking a chicken or taking a goat or something to the witch doctor and getting instant whatever. They think that's going to help. Anyway, this girl, that that was her story. She had pins. She said she didn't kill the cow, so I don't know. That's the story. I had a bit of trouble believing that, so I come home and prayed and said, God, is that real, you know, was that really happening? And anyway, he led me to this book called Blue Mart's Battle, a Lutheran minister back in the early 1800s who, who didn't know nothing about deliverance or possession and came across a woman who was possessed by a principality who was and who was so demonised that there was she was vomiting up sand and glass and uh, iron and nails coming out of her eyes and pins and needles coming out of her tongue and out of her mouth and and through it th- out of her nose and and stuff like that. Like it's called Bloom Hearts Battle. It's only a small book. You can download it for nothing. Uh, if you want to, you know, look into the depths of Satan, which is so deep. You know, it says an unfounded curse cannot cannot alight. But if we're walking in sin, unrepentant sin, and there's a slightest doorway open, and if God's been telling you to repent and you don't repent, then you're open to these things. If, I'll give you a hint. If you feel something in your body, 
any pain anywhere in your body, say your heart, your your head, your legs, your arm, or even emotional attacks, you want to rebuke them straight away. Treat them as witchcraft, treat them as a curse, and you'll be surprised at how quick they stop and go away because the devil's at work all the time. You know, and God uses this stuff to teach us and to train us how to fight, how to stand, because he wants us to fight. The the word says that cursed be those who refuse to pick up their sword and draw blood. He wants us to stand. He wants to wants us to fight in the power and authority that he's given us to come against the works of the devil, come against the power of the devil and set the captives free. So when we learn how to set ourselves free and, and uh fight the battle then we can move on to others and that's what he wants from us read uh luke 4 18 we're to walk in the same ministry as jesus did so yeah rebuke and uh bind and um command to leave in the name of jesus christ the name above all names so when you pray pray in precatory prayers against the uh demons the strong man the uh, unclean spirits, the wicked spirits that are surrounding them, that are animating these people because they're carrying a truckload of them. And they're the things that are going to wear the power of the prayers. So, you know, you're not to attack the humans, but the spirits will flee when you start attacking them. You were a wizard. That's for, right. for Okay, now, uh, let's just, for the audience sake, what is a wizard? Let's, let's define what does that mean. Yeah, a wizard is somebody who leaves his body and then go out doing things for Satan. Some of the things that he does is that he manipulates people, he kills people, he puts sickness and diseases, he puts curses, he makes sure that people's life are backwards, he makes sure that people will not have the skill to serve God, he prevents people from knowing God and coming to Christ. Mm -hmm. Such people is classified as a wizard because wizards, we leave our body and go out and do things and after that come back to the body. It's a high class uh, wizard. So basically when you want to identify or to, to, to really know who is a wizard, a wizard or a witch is someone who has the ability to leave his or her body and do things for Satan. That's what we call witches or wizards. Okay, so a lot of that has to do with traveling, I suppose. You know, we could call that the astral plane. Right, that's, that's right. And and they that's go right. in, into that, I know, and they can, they, in other words, they can travel by way of that and then go into someone's house, let's say. That's right. And while they're sleeping and, and do something bad to them or hurt them. You're right, way, you're right. Or cause them to be... Um, whatever, to be uh, enslaved. Yeah, what they do is that they leave their bodies. Okay. They leave their bodies and go. You see, they have the power to invoke the spirit of death. They have the power to, 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 to bring sicknesses to their loved ones and their families. They have the power to strike them while their families are, are in bed. They, they have the power to manipulate them. They have the power to put the spirit of uh, a fighting, fighting spirit. They have, they have the power to destroy ma marriages. So all that the enemy wanted to use these young folks for is that to make sure that they cause a lot of havoc. Now they have the power to invoke the spirit of that. They even bring death because they have the power to, 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 to do this. You know, remember they possess extraordinary power. They are witches. And they, they are, they saw witch, witchcraft involved their soul, witchcraft involved, they are, they are, they are, they are, they are world. So what, are, so what happens is that when they are operating, they leave their body and they, could, they can do whatever they want to do. If they want to bring death to a person, it's, it's easy. If they want to strike a person with infirmities, it is very easy. If they want to manipulate somebody, it is very easy. If they want to man manipulate you to commit suicide by hanging yourself or by taking a pill, it's very easy. If they, re they really want you to, to smoke, to take drugs, it just releases those spirits. So this is how they do it. But they, they can do it both both at night because they have the eyes to see. And they can do something in the spirit that you, you will not see. So what, what happens is that if it's in the night, then their soul 
with, together with the witchcraft spirit will leave their body while they are asleep and start doing that. So they will do that in the realms of the spirit, and within less than two weeks, 14 days, the thing will begin to uh, materialize, or you will see the physical manifestation of whatever they have done in the realms of the spirit. So if it is death, within 14 days, the person will die. If it is sickness, infirmities, within 14 days, there will be illness. If it is to smoke, within 14 days, whatever. If it is divorce, the same thing, because uh, witches are in, in charge of divorce. You know, in, 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 in America, yeah. now divorce is a fashion, you know. And divorce also contaminates. It's spread. It contaminates. Yeah, these attacks the world calls sleep paralysis, but it's happened to me four times. It happened to me wife before. The first time I woke up, I couldn't move. I couldn't do anything. I couldn't speak. All I could think was, help me, Jesus. I couldn't even speak it. And then I could just get a whisper out of my mouth, help me, Jesus. And then... I could uh, speak it out a bit louder, help me Jesus, and then the thing went. And then it happened again in the same scenario. I couldn't speak, but as soon as I thought, help me Jesus, I, I gained the strength to speak, help me Jesus, or whisper, and then I spoke it loud. And then the third time it happened, we've got a uh, steel um, wood heater with a steel flue going up into the roof, and I, I knew what was going on, so I, I had to do the same thing, you know, thought, help me, Jesus, then whisper, help me, Jesus. And then instead of speaking, help me, Jesus, I said, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. And I felt this thing just get ripped off me, and it headed, like, in the direction that it was ripped off. It smacked into the steel flue of the heater and rattled the whole thing. And I thought, wow, so this thing was sort of, it was invisible, but it was, there was a physical aspect to it that, you know, surprised me. But then I realised what was going on. That happened a few years ago. But these things happened. I was encouraged that God had showed me, you know, what was going on. He only lets these things happen to teach us, especially if we're walking in his will and we're doing the right thing, you know, we're repenting, forgiven. And uh, and he's got to train us to fight, to understand. It says in the Word, get the wisdom, and with all I getting, get understanding. And, and, you know, and we can't learn to fight or stand or understand without being in the battle. So praise God. Don't see every attack or everything, anything that's happening that's like supernatural as all coming from the enemy it might be coming from the enemy but god's letting it through to teach you so learn to be encouraged when you when you gain some ground and gain some understanding now folks i laughed a little bit earlier but no we're being deadly serious here this stuff's going on it's done under satanic power and uh, you don't want to be doing it number one but um this stuff is occurring out there um bill i've heard people say hey there were people astral projecting, and they were looking in on me as I was sleeping, or some have said that they've had astral sex. Uh, is this actually going on? Uh, I'm afraid so, yes. And uh, people have, now I believe when you, this is a little different phenomenon, I believe there are people that believe, uh, both women and men, that they have been uh, sexually attacked in their sleep. Yes. By, by, something that was palpable, that was real, and in some cases visible. And I think those are fallen angels. Okay, so i got to throw a question out to you. Yeah, it hasn't happened recently, thank God. But a few years ago, I had a dream, and three heavy set women jumped my bones in the dream. <laughs> oh. Was, uh, could I have been a victim of uh, astral projection by three witches? That could be, because see, that's one thing, and I'm glad you brought this up, because one thing that witches and occultists use this uh, actual thing for is they will try and get into a person's dreams and attack you in your dreams. And that's why we recommend that as part of your evening devotions that you pray and ask Yahushua, Jesus, to uh, protect your dreams and walk with you in your dreams and watch over your dreams. Because let's face it, when you're asleep, you're pretty vulnerable. You know, and if, if you, because I mean, people like you and I and others who have, 
you know, set themselves up to oppose uh, the occult and the kingdom of darkness, you know, obviously we're making a lot of bad guys unhappy. And if they can find a way to get into any part of our lives, they will do it. And, of course, we teach people to, to bless their homes, you know, to go from room to room and to, to anoint their doorposts and their lintels and pray over their homes. And then we have prayers and explanations how to do this on our website. We also recommend that people, the land that they're on, doesn't matter if you're renting or owning, it doesn't matter if you're in an apartment, in a condo, or in a home, a house, rather. You plead the blood of Yahushua over your over the land and remit the sin of the shedding of innocent blood over the land. And again, we have the prayers how to do that on our website. Uh, that will help keep out the astral intruders and Paul and angelic intruders. But yeah, if you don't pray over your dreams, you may very well have you know witches or other unsavory characters showing up in your dreams, trying to mess with your head and maybe even mess with your body. When you pray every night, you can pray for God to send his angels to protect you. You can pray for walls and, and uh, gates and bars and hedges, thorn hedges. Anything that's in the Bible, you can loose blindness and confusion and chaos and destruction into the into the second heaven. See, it's the demons that are, are in these people that are coming... They're the ones going to wear it. The people that are using them for their dirty deeds, well, there it happens to them too. But you want to pray, you know, for salvation for these people, repentance, fear of the Lord, conviction of sin, and things like that for the witches because they're confused, most of them, and they don't know what they're doing. Here's the story of... Uh, these witches in one of the groups that I mentioned earlier, they came to uh, attack this man who has a ministry in America, exposing the darkness, and they didn't like him, and they were threatening him, and anyway, they went to um, astral travel, so this is what happened. This is the email that was sent to this man when they tried to attack him. I can't mention too much because they're in fear of their life. They're only young Christian. They haven't got the trust in God that they'll get as they grow stronger. It said the head of our group basically rotted in front of me. As I observed the coven being unconscious and trying to do the astral projection to your house, their hair literally turned grey as I watched within like minutes I wanted to wake them up but got told that just waking someone up while doing the meditation was a very risky dangerous thing so I didn't do it the other four individuals who tried to project weren't hurt they just reported when they woke up that they suddenly lost completely control of their movement when they were able to see your house they told me that they spinned around wildly in their spiritual bodies like they had epilepsy or something of that sort and their spirit eyes suddenly turned blind not being able to see anything as they were kicked back into their bodies. The head of our lodge, however, I could literally see some of their hair turning grey suddenly as the physical body turned violently and also had an epileptic-like attack except that this was their real form. They crashed with their head very heavily against the concrete floor and afterwards the police considered it to be an accident. So maybe they crashed real hard. But anyway, that's God protecting. This this man who had the ministry didn't even know this was going on. He knew that, that these people had, had threatened him. He knew they were witches. He was waiting and he was prepared and he was... Uh, he was prayed up. He'd done no spiritual warfare. And when you do that, all you can do is wait and trust in God. And God delivered. And God showed him his protection by getting this person to email him after they were saved and showing him what actually happened in the attack. I mean, how much would that encourage you? Okay. Another thing that's a little less spiritual and more practical, we suggest that people pray and ask the Almighty to protect their dreams. Because the dream realm is where the enemy gets at you. Just as the Holy Spirit can communicate to you through dreams, 
but so can the enemy. And many people report, oh, you know, we have nightmares or we have, or our children have night terrors. And we ask, do you pray and ask the Almighty to, um, you know, to protect your dreams and to walk with you in your dreams or to send angels to be with you in your dreams? What do you think is mm -hmm. happening in the dream state? Because we have people that uh, contact us to say uh, they've been attacked uh, by spirits when they dream, or you know, they've been fed food. Uh, recently, I had a dream, and someone tried to steal my truck that I drive three times. I had a guy tell me yesterday, he's driving a bus, and someone stole his bicycle. So, I mean, uh, I know that God can speak through dreams, but it's not always God speaking, is it? No, and the way we look at it, I mean, you know, I, I made a great study in my, of dreams in my life because even as a child I was fascinated with them. And, you know, I think there are dreams that we, we call them garbage dreams. They're just kind of like your, your soul is like working through something, like maybe you had a stressful day, and, and it's just like something like you say, like you're, you know, driving a bus naked or you're, somebody steals your truck or things like that, and it might not mean anything, you know. Uh, then there are dreams that come from the Holy Spirit. And the, that, again, you can pray and ask for discernment. You know, like, and, and one thing that's really helpful is if you have a dream that's meaningful, write it down. Have a little dream journal and write it down. Because, you know, you know how dreams are so evanescent, they kind of go. Yeah. I mean, you remember them the first five minutes, and then oftentimes you don't remember them unless that's something striking. Because I used to have, when I was first involved in spiritual warfare and deliverance, I used to have terrifying nightmares. And I would wake up screaming all the time because the devils were after me, you know, because they didn't like the fact. And they they realize that we're more vulnerable in our dreams. That's why, and I don't know about you, but I've had so many people call me and say, I get wakened up almost every night with a nightmare at 3.30 yeah. in the morning. 3 in the morning, 3.30, you're right. Yeah, and, and the reason for that is, is that is when the quote-unquote astral plane is quiet. Everybody's in deep slumber, at least in our part of the world, and witches believe that they can go out and strike people with greater effectiveness from 3 to 3.30. Whoa. And, and so that's why many people, they'll say, well, I wake up and I have this horrible dream and I look at the clock and it's 3.30 or it's 3.33 or something like that. What does that mean? And I say, well, it, it's a, a tactical thing that Satanists and witches do. If they want to curse somebody or invade your dreams, because see, you know, I'm not saying all of this is supported by the Bible, but I don't think any of it is contrary to the Bible. I think the dream realm is a realm that you can access if you are actually projecting. And I don't recommend any Christian do that. You know, that's something that we're forbidden. If the, if the Holy Spirit takes you out of your body, like what happened to John the Beloved in the book of Revelation, or what happened to Ezekiel, that's different, obviously. But you should not sit down and say, okay, now I'm going to go leave my body, you know, because that's witchcraft. And it's also very dangerous, because if your soul leaves your body, that means there's a vacuum there. And guess what can come in? And see, I used to astrally project. I used to do it. I used to teach classes in it when I was a witch. And I know that every time I left my body, some other evil thing would come in. And that's why I had a lot of demons. But, you know, the, the point is, is that, is that witches can actually project into your dreams. Even though your house may be protected, even though you might be fortified, you know, you might have no unclean thing in your house. You might have a mezuzah on your doorpost, which we highly recommend. But, you know, they can still get into your dreams unless you pray and ask Father, to protect your dreams and to put angels around your dreams. And we have found that since we do that, unless it's something the Holy Spirit wants to show us, we almost never have a nightmare, ever. Okay, so let's say uh, you do wake up and you've had a real terrible dream, you know, some kind of attack hit you. Uh, do you just go on about your business or should we respond to it? No, no, I, you know, either I or usually, you know, if either my wife or I have a dream like that, we'll wake the other party up, and we'll pray immediately. And we'll say, Abba, Father, it's like, you know, we rebuke this in Yahushua's name, whatever it is. We do not Because here's the thing. You don't want to receive these things into your soul. 
Okay. And so uh, we just say, we rebuke that in Yahushua's name. We ask you to put right now on us the full armor, especially the helmet of salvation and the breastplate of righteousness. And we just command any evil thing that might be trying to access us to leave now and never to return, you know. And and so, yeah, I think you should do immediate warfare with something like that. Because otherwise, if you, because I know the temptation is to go, Oh, uh, you know, go back to sleep. But if you do that, I've actually had dreams that lasted through three wake-ups. Whoa. You know, and, and one of them or two of them were very intense dreams from the spirit. You know, they weren't bad. You know, but, but usually they'll take advantage of that if you don't pray and shut the doorway. Well, we're on the subject of dream attacks. When we were in Uganda, we held a crusade up in North Uganda, and we met this fellow, he come to the crusade and he, he was uh, playing around with witchcraft and he came to test the powers that, that we had against what he had and anyway the Holy Spirit arrested him, he got saved and um, he went alright for a few weeks and then he started having problems again and he wrote to me and he said I used to have beautiful women in the dream, especially in the night. I used to sleep with these ladies daily, and I only used to meet my wife daytime in the night. I told her I need to rest, and we used to sleep in two different beds in one room. I was free and delivered, but now things have changed. These ladies have started coming again. When I was a soldier, we used to sleep with some ladies, especially when you feel you need a woman. We were given an egg, and we light a candle in the middle of the night to bring a woman, and we could sleep with any woman as long as you know the name. So he told me that the, the, he learnt to do this in the army. Whether I didn't, I didn't ask him if it was the army that taught him or just people in the army, but they... T I believe the army taught him so they could stay out on patrol longer without, you know, getting a bit restless and anxious and wanting to go home. So they taught him this witchcraft technique, and he was using other witchcraft techniques to uh, to um, protect himself. And this was Jimmy. He was even um, going without his physical wife and getting used to these other women he wanted them more than he did his physical wife. Then he says a bit later, I'll be grateful if you consider me and put me in your program. I want you to pray for my home. Please come before these things kill me. I am suffering too much. So I sent him some prayers, some warfare prayers, and uh, he prayed them and the things went away. He stood and exercised the power and authority that we all have as born again believers. Praise God. And I, I met a fella about 18 months ago who was in jail for a while, and he said one night a spirit visited him or something visited him. He didn't know what it was, and he it jumped on top of him and started trying to rape him. And anyway, he's felt down. He didn't know if it was his uh, cellmate or what, so he's felt down, and the thing spoke to him and said, Don't worry, I'm a woman. And anyway, he let it have its way with him. And then the next night, instead of panicking and worrying about it, he actually got, he went and had a shower, got dressed up, put some smelly stuff on and was waiting for it, was keen. So these things are real, you know. They're demons. You can't let them in. You've got to uh, rebuke them because... You know, once they get the advantage, or once they get the legal right, they can do whatever they want. And I, I was sitting in the church and trying to bring this order, trying to bring spirit. Even when I used to actually project, the only neighborhood that I was not able to penetrate and I was not able to curse was a neighborhood that was strong Christians praying for the neighborhood because I was seeing them in the spirit realm. Because when you pray and you pray in the spirit, you enter the spirit realm. Okay, as a Christian, you enter the spirit realm and you start bringing down strongholds on the enemy for your neighborhood, for your family, for your for your for for your for your. Uh, uh, Whatever, your, your friend, your brother, your, your, your cousin, you start bringing strongholds in the spirit round. So I would see these Christians in the corner praying for their neighborhoods in the spirit round as I was cruising the neighborhoods of, uh, of, the, of, of the city, of New York City, of the boroughs to curse them. But I, when I came down to curse the Christian neighborhoods, that I saw the Christians in the corner and, and together holding hands of unity and power in the Holy Spirit, I couldn't curse that neighborhood. I had to leave that neighborhood and look for a weak neighborhood to curse.
because I did plenty of witchcraft. I did witchcraft to people, which I, I killed people in ICU. I did witchcraft. I gave people abortions with the witchcraft, and I'm not boasting about that because God has forgiven me for my sins Amen. in the name of Jesus. I'm just pointing out the diabolical practices that these people practice, and some people might come online and say, well, I never did that. Why? Because maybe you're still an amateur. You're still on, you're still on, 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 on the baby pool. Wait, Amen. They're not... The, they're not hard. They're not hardcore yet. Now listen. No, not um, hardcore. But when, when when you start rising up, the demo start demanding more of you. And if you don't right. give them what you want, I remember when I was in witchcraft, I wanted to take a sabbatical. I wanted to take a time out because I was exhausted spiritually, and and I took a time out. And and the devil said, you can't take a time out. They told me you can't take a time. Out. I said, well, I'm taking a time out anyway because I'm going to do whatever I want to do. Bruce, I was blind for one year. I was registered with the commission of the blind. They took my eyesight for one year. Wow. And I have, I have, I, in my book. In, in my book, I have, Brother Bruce, I have the certificate of legal blindness from the New York State uh, printed in the book to show you that I'm, I'm, I'm telling you the truth. Hey Amen. What you're saying is the devil is a hard taskmaster. Yes, he People is. Go in there, he doesn't want them to go in there and then walk away. It's like the mafia. Uh, mm -hmm. You go out in a pine wood box, right? Yeah, it's worse than the mafia because at least at, at, at least the mafia you can see them coming, but you can't see the devil coming when he comes to you. You're playing with the devil and think that he's doing you favors. Get out of a Bible and start reading it, and start uh, asking Jesus Christ to reveal Himself and see what happens. You'll find out who's your friend and who's your enemy real quick. I wasn't in it nowhere near as deep as these fellas here, but when I wanted out. This is where I ended up, drug addicted. I had that much noise in my head, I couldn't read a book or watch TV, so I just stayed drunk. I was suicidal with nightmares every night, and these were the spirits that were playing up. Voices in my head, they, were, they wouldn't leave me alone night and day, 24 hours a day for a few years. And then when I got saved, when I went to church, and or when I got the day I got born again, that night there was only one dream, the next day there was peace, there was joy, there was hope, there were, the addictions were gone, the fears were gone, the noises, the voices, the anxiety, the depression, the suicidal thoughts, all gone. Jesus Christ set me free. It says in the word, the thief comes up with the steal, to kill and destroy, but I've come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. The devil's a deceiver, he'll, he'll delude. He's a thief, a liar, and a murderer. You've been uh, deceived. If you're playing his game, you need to come out and get born again. And when you do, when you make your mind up, you've got to be solid. You can't, you start going in and going out, you'll, you'll probably end up dead. So be serious about it. There's life away from the devil. My job is that after I have been groomed to the extent that I am now a full-blown demonic man, I will now go in and destroy and, and to deceive and to become an agent of the devil to make sure that we deceive people, we kill people, we destroy people. Okay, now, when you were uh, functioning mm -hmm. as a witch doctor, mm -hmm. um, would you put curses on people? Yes, I did that. Would you kill people? I did that. I killed I killed did a lot of people. You? Did it bother you at, at that, that time? time? At that time, it, 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 it didn't bother. I was deceived because people were coming to me to do their job. So I thought it was fine. You see, uh, those who have been to school were coming to me, doctors and lawyers, everybody. The society was hailing us. So at that time, I didn't see anything wrong with, with it because I, I had about 15 eyes. And then I could see my back, my front, my sides, I could see. So I could even see your intestines, and I just had to put my, my hand in the realm of spirit in your intestines, pull it out, and start complaining to me, and within the next two hours, you are dead. I did all these things. Hmm. So a lot of people listening to us think that's all phony, but mm -hmm. it's not. It's not. It's, it's a real thing that I'm talking about. I mean, it's real. You see, that's why the, the Bible did not shut up about we wrestle not against flesh and blood. That's why the Bible did not keep quiet about I have created a destroyer to destroy. That's why the Bible didn't say that he's coming down to us. You see, so that the Bible wants us to know that the guy is here, and if we are not careful, he can dis dis destroy. At the age of 11, 12, I could turn five different type of creatures already. And yeah, you, you could turn could into turn five different, different animals? animals already. Give me an example of what yeah, kind of animal. Butterfly, snake. 
Now, when you turned into these animals, yes. um, did it mean like your spirit went yeah, that, into yeah, them? Yeah, in the realm of a spirit, my spirit will turn into these animals and go and destroy. We don't go and destroy in a human form. Now, there are people listening to us right now that are saying, that's nonsense. There's no way someone can do that. Yeah. I've got to add here that I knew a fellow who was a witch, and I seen him. He shapeshifted right in front of me, with and his head turned into a giant wolf head, and his girlfriend was there, and I looked at her, and I wasn't expecting that, and but I was playing around with stuff I shouldn't have been, and it wasn't, it didn't scare me one little bit, but I was just a, more amazed than shocked, and I looked at her and said, you see that? And she said, see what? And she had this weird look on her face, like a, a weird grin on her face. Then I looked back to him and he's just still got the big wolf head. And then I looked at her again and then looked back and he's back to normal with a weird grin on his face. And I just shook my head and thought, wow, what was that? Was that an hallucination or what's going on there? But anyway, it was amazing. And I'll tell you about the Rosicrucians. They came one night because I made the oath to have my uh, throat slit from ear to ear if I spoke about any of the secrets. And I put a video on YouTube that uh, exposed the whole the, the witchcraft of the Rosicrucians. So they came one night. They were giving me hard time for about 18 months. They came in me dreams and two men walked up to me and just grabbed me by the head and slit me throat and I looked down and all his blood's gushing down and it was like a full on nightmare and then they went and sat down and I got a stick, there was a stick laying down there and I picked it up and started belting them around the head with it, then I woke up and I was freaking out. What a nightmare and I said to God, I'm sick of these mongrels, God, you know, let me back in that dream and give me a weapon to sort them out with. So I went back in, he let me go back into the dream. I ended up with a human sacrifice in my dream and I had a weapon and I, uh, God was animating me. I didn't know how to use this weapon at all that he gave me. People turned into demons and where they got me, I got about a hundred of them and just chopped them into confetti and never from that day on did I have any more trouble with them after that. So God really sort of, he just totally sorted things out. I've been, you know, attacked in me dreams. Once you're out of the witchcraft, they never leave you alone. I, I was, uh, I've seen wolves and bears and snakes and scorpions and, and lions and and spiders and all sorts of animals coming. I had a, a black cat hanging around the house, big black cat, real spooky looking thing, and I prayed the next day it splattered on the road out the front. God got it run over, so well, you just got to pray, you know, and keep your eyes open, but in the end you don't fear, you look at them like... Uh, God will show you what's going on and look at him as him revealing the enemy that's trying to bring you down and he'll turn it around so you you attack it and destroy it in the name of Jesus Christ. You mentioned earlier that you had attempts on your life. Mm -hmm. R roughly how many of them did were physical? Oh, I think probably somewhere between maybe 10 or 12. Wow. Probably 10. And about how many were like metaphysical or spiritual oh, attacks? Oh, I couldn't even count them. I mean, you know, they come almost, if not every day, at least every week. Because the, the area, what do you say, metaphysical is a big word. It just means basically some kind of curse. Right. Some kind of, you know, energetic attack of a malignant nature. And, you know, we've learned over the years to just, Every day we just pray and ask Yahweh to protect us. We put on the armor of God. We cover our cells and our house and our family under the blood of Yeshua. And, um, and you know, 99 out of 100 of these things don't get through. You know, but every now and then one gets through. And I think it's just to kind of keep you humble. Okay. And would you give us some details of some of the physical attempts on your life? Well, I, I think I'd already mentioned the, the attempt to, you know, poison me with the stuff on my forehead. Uh, we were shot at. Uh, of course, we had the werewolf attack. Tell, uh, tell me about the shooting. Well, just driving down the road and, and someone shot 
right through the window of the truck I was driving and and you know fortunately I was wearing you know this is how these strange things work I happen to have this strange fetish I like when I'm just knocking around or you know not doing anything very important I love to wear bib overalls and so uh, it kind of goes with my you know hillbilly preacher persona I guess and anyway I was driving around I had um, bib overalls on and the bullet hit the buckle on the bib overalls, which is right here. You're kidding! And it shattered the buckle, but you know it left me with this huge bruise on my chest. But obviously, it would have gone right into my heart or very near my heart. And I just—it wow. was just a drive, so to speak, a, a person driving in the opposite lane. And I just, you know, pulled over, and, <laughs> you know, kind of because it felt like someone punched me real hard in the chest. So it was a good shot. When you said, I assumed he had a bad shot and missed you. No, no, no. <laughs> wow. And uh, then there was the interesting time that um, we were driving. It was it was a late. See, we used to live out in the country when I was out in Seattle, and sort of five mile drive into town. And after work, we were driving into town. It was this two lane, rather twisty, turny road. We got about fifty miles an hour, and it was raining in Seattle, naturally, and it was dark. And as we were driving along, I noticed two things. One, I noticed that there was this very tall angel-like thing standing in the road going like this. Was he physical? Yes. Well, it looked physical to me. To it looked you. like a tall guy in a white robe. How tall? Well, it was hard to tell because he was like, you know, maybe a hundred yards away. But mm -hmm. he looked like a pretty big dude. And I then, secondarily, I noticed that the headlights that were coming at me in the opposite direction looked slightly obscured. And so somebody told me, you know, stop, jam on the brakes. So I stopped and jammed on the brakes, and I came within a foot of hitting this giant Douglas fir that someone had chopped down right onto the, the highway. And I felt so sorry because there's this guy behind me, and he must not have realized what was going on. He probably didn't have an angel. And he passed me. He had this nice brand new Beamer. And he went vroom right into this tree, and it just sheared off. Fortunately, it was like, you know, how trees might fall, and they're kind of off the ground because mm -hmm. of the branches. And it sheared off the entire top of his brand new BMW sedan. But fortunately, it didn't hurt him. But it would have hurt you because it, it was lower where because you were. It was low, and we were, uh, we were a taller vehicle. And um, we just, you know, thank Yahweh for that one. Wow. And um, then I mentioned the werewolf attack. And I suppose the other one that's really probably the most interesting one from the standpoint of what the power of Yahweh can do as we were out. One time my parents came out to um, visit us and we were kind of showing them around. We were driving them up to Mount Rainier. I think it was actually back at that time. We were driving back from Mount Rainier around this kind of narrow two-lane road. And all of a sudden we are driving along and this semi is coming at us. And he comes over deliberately into our lane. And he, you know, how when a semi turns, is it's like the rear end of him stills in the other lane because it's a big long thing. There was no place to go, and you just have time to say, you know, now I don't know if this was an attempt on our life or it was just some asleep driver, but obviously it would have been fatal. And I just same, you know, my father was with me in the front seat, and Sharon was with my stepmother in the back seat. And, you know, I just cried out to you know Yahweh, and we hit, and we just went right through the semi. Wow. As if we were intangible. Wow. The semi went right through us, or we went through it, or, or both. You know, it was like our molecules just sort of blend for a second. And I can even remember seeing the engine of the semi <gasps> as I was going through it. You wow. know, it was one of the weirder experiences of my life. And I'll never forget, you know, the look on my father's face. <laughs> because, you know, I don't think people in the back seat even realized what was about to happen. And he looked at me and, like, I'm not going to talk about this. <laughs> we didn't, they never mentioned it, you know, because it was just so far outside of my father's, you know, because he was this nice, you know, good old garden variety Catholic, and he wasn't used to people dematerializing semis, you know. So, you know, but it, that was a real blessing, because obviously we would have been a hood ornament, you know, on this giant Mack truck. So we're trained as a voodoo incarnate to how to, to hear the voice of the demons how to speak to the demons, how to destroy churches, how to case people, how to do every kind of evil, how to kill, you know, full time controlled by the evil spirits, full time controlled by the devil himself. That's what it means to be able to incarnate, to be fully controlled by the evil forces. Now, after that, they say that 
to graduate as a Voodoo incarnate, you should sacrifice at least 80 people. You know, and it was not easy to sacrifice 80 people. So I used to move from hospital to hospital. You know, because when you become a Voodoo incarnate, you are given power by the devil to change into anything. You know, I can steal somebody's face and become like, uh, do some sort of impersonating. You know, going to the hospital, I still, I become like a doctor. You know, then I get the syringe and I start passing from bed to bed, injecting people, they are dying, I inject, this one dies, I inject. So at the end of the day, you find that two, uh, 30, 30 people could die at the same time in the hospital. And the doctors could, couldn't even understand why these people have died. Because when you ask them, they say, no, the doctor came here, he, he attended to us, he attended to this person, but he died. Not knowing that the doctor who came was not the real doctor, was a fake doctor, a voodoo incarnate. You know, because they are everywhere, they are in hospitals, they are everywhere in churches. Yeah. Apart from that, again, we, we used to do a lot of things like uh, causing accidents, you know, using the forces of darkness. You know, just cast a spell upon the driver, then he just sees the blackout. Then from there, he doesn't see the Lord, then the vehicle turns, then they die, just like that. I want to tell you about the hell dogs, the dogs in Uganda. That there's a lot of stray dogs, they all look the same. They're about the size of a sheep dog and sort of look like, sort of, goldy colour, like a dingo sort of thing. But, um... We were having a crusade one night, and the crusade had ended. And we walked out of the grounds, and it was a, it was in a, a school. And we walked through the gates, and there was a dog hiding around the corner. And as soon as I walked out, it's looked at me in the eyes like this from from down here, and followed me all the way around like this, just looking at me fair in the eyes and it's gone like this, look, looking straight at me in the eyes and it was really made their hairs on the back of my head stand up and this dog was about the size of a greyhound and was the mongrelest, ugliest looking, mangy looking thing you've ever seen in your life and it, I've never seen a dog just totally stare in your eyeballs like that as it's, you know, it knew what it was looking at. It was really like really sort of freaky and uh you know i believe in astral projection i know it exists because i used to be able to do it when i was um doing witchcraft stuff and uh i also have got you know i could have been a shapeshifter i believe that you know that the depths of satan humans fully demonized can shapeshift and I mean, if there was an ugly mongrel demon dog in Uganda, then that was it. And it was like it was spying. And as soon as we seen it, it took off. I mean, we're... and there was another, we went out handing tracks out into the, you know, we went into bars and into brothels and up in this down and out, like, sub suburb. And that night, we, we were staying in a suburb in Kampala with this African family and we had gates that you could lock and there was about four or five dogs standing right at the gate. The, the house was on a, probably an eighth of an acre. It was only enough room for a three-bedroom house and about 10 or 15 feet around the edge of it for the yard. And, um, yeah, these dogs, there would have been four or five of them just going, Arr! right at the gate howling and howling making all these weird noises and I was laying in bed and I just said I rebuke you in the name of Jesus Christ and they shut up like that they just bang instantly stopped and that happened twice the dogs they'd come around you know right at the gate like making a heap of racket and I just said I rebuke you dogs in the name of Jesus and bang like that instantly they stopped you know and i thought that was pretty good that's the power and authority that jesus gives us when we become born again believers and i believe that we stirred up the 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 enemy in the um handing out the tracks you know preaching the gospel what we're doing he come to annoy that was the best he could do but instantly you know through the the power and the word of god in the name of Jesus, they just shut up, and that was pretty good.
Now, on that. if you're just joining us, you've got a man on tonight who he was grained, groomed as a child to be a witch and to work for Papa Doc Duvalier. Uh, a witch was actually his tutor, and his father would train him in the ways of witchcraft. And one of the things that witches do, and even Christians do, not knowing that they're involving themselves in witchcraft, is to curse people. So when a curse is sent forth, um, you're actually sending a demon to go out and perform a particular function, like attack somebody's health or um, attack their relationship. What, what, how would you define a curse, Earthquake? Yeah, you hit it right on the head. That's what it is. It's the, the breaking down of a person's character, their mobility, their mental uh, ability to carry on their function of their life. It's just like when I was a boxer. Um, the art of pugilism is to render your opponent helpless. That's basically what a curse is, is to render you helpless, where you cannot operate as the, as as a well human being should. You become not a human being anymore. You become a human trying and not being. That's what a curse's job is, is to keep you trying and fail. Everything you do, you fail. I used to be a sorcerer. And people run me off the road and flip me the bird and stuff like that. And I used to get even with people. Oh, years ago, I get even with you. You wouldn't make it home, seriously. And I, and I could do that without, without a gun or a knife because I knew how to manipulate the environment to make stuff bad happen to people. Okay. Folks, if you're tuning in, we're live with Earthquake Kelly. Uh, he went through a lot to be able to be here today and tell you and I um, about how the enemy would like to capture your soul out there. He wants to entrap you, ambush you, take you to hell. Jesus came to give life and life more abundantly. Um, Earthquake, we have very little knowledge out there in the deliverance ministry on how to fight back against witchcraft. And yet witchcraft is everywhere, and we're all encountering it. Um, I want to ask you some questions, and this is one of the reasons sure. we went through this, so you can answer questions and help us to be an overcomer. I hear the term a curse. What is a curse as it relates to witchcraft? What's happening when someone is being cursed? And there's also scripture that talks about a curse causeless shall not come. I've always wondered about that. What's your take on that subject of the curse? What's going on when people are being cursed? I, I, give, you, I give you an example from what I used to be 40, 46 years ago when I was a sorcerer. You know the hardest person that we had trouble um, uh, putting the curse, one, a per, curse on was a person who was filled with the Holy Ghost, who prayed and fast, who knew who they were, and Jesus could never curse them. Never. But those that played church was a Sunday going church and really didn't care. Man, we were it'd be like a, a three wing circus with them. Because they really didn't have what they possessed pros, what they say they had. Professing, right. Yeah. Professing yeah, thank you. It must be that New Yorker accent come out every now and then, Shan. But thirty three three But the, but what they were professing to have, they didn't have, and, and so we 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 knew who who they were. So I'll give you a case in point how how this curse and, and curse came. There was these two brothers that used to hang with me called the Davis brothers. They were my they were my, my only one of the few people that that really would hang with me because I, I wasn't I wasn't always nice all the time, you know. But they would hang with me and they and they dealt with me and. And they 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 didn't like what I did. They were they weren't afraid to tell me about myself because if you're gonna burn my house down, you're gonna burn it anyway. So they just tell me, and 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 we was cool like that, you know. We was cool, and um, they went to a revival downtown Stanford, Stanford, Connecticut, not Stanford, New York, Stanford, Connecticut. It was a tent revival there, and they went, and they got too close to the fire, and they got saved. And I mean saved. Ooh, those guys were saved. So they came back in the community, tell everybody about Jesus. Man, they talked to the stop sign about Jesus, tell it to go. You know, that's how it was about Jesus. But so I'm standing off in the back. Now I can sense, I can sense this presence of something good from all the way around the corner before they even got there. I can, I said, hold on a second, something, something is changing in this community. Something's changed. 
something's changing here. I can, I can feel the opposing side, which was God. I can feel it. I didn't want it, but I can feel it. And so when I got up close to them from a distance, I looked. I said, wait a minute. They're my boys. Something different about them. So I got a little closer. They were still talking to somebody about Jesus. I got a little closer. They was talking. And I got right up on them, and they turned around and said, Kirky. I said, well, what's up, man? They said, man, we went and got saved. I said, saved? Oh, no, that's what my mom be talking about all the time. Said, Come on, man, you need to be saved, Kirk. You need to be saved. I said, no, I don't want nothing, I don't want nothing to do with, with that. I don't want nothing to do with that. You know what I do, and that, that's not my thing. That's not my thing. I was getting real mad because I had too many friends because people were scared of me. And so that was, my, that was my, 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 my friends. So that night when I went and between the, the um, sessions with my dad, and I got a break there for a few minutes. I said, uh, I called two spirits, one bigger one, one smaller one. I said, I want you to go and curse to David's brother. Go curse him. And so I sent I sent the smaller one out. I said, this should be easy. That Christian stuff, this should be real easy. So I sent him out. I said, that shouldn't take too long. And he came back. <laughs> I can't curse them. I can't curse them. I said, what you talking about? I told you to go and curse them. He said, I can't. I can't. I said, I told you to curse them. I can't. So the other spirit was standing by me. I said, well, failure, you don't fail me. I said, you don't fail me. When I send you to do something, you do it. And so I sent the other one out, Shannon, the bigger one. And he disappeared through the darkness and left the room. And a little while, he came back. <sighs> can't do it. Can't do it. They're protected. I said, nothing fails around here. I curse anything in this community. I'm running this community. Nothing is able to withstand when I send something out. So I we did what's called astral projection. I stepped out of my flesh, and I went into the spiritual realm. I went to see what was going on while these two spirits that never failed me before came back without completing the mission I sent them on. So I went there. And I and I hovered in the, in the shadows, even though he couldn't see me. I still, when you're a shadowy person, you still feel like you got to hide, so to speak. So I hovered around like an edge of the perimeter, looking, and I see these two big old, tall angels walking around them. And I say, wait a minute, these guys not from this. Hold on a second, where these big old giants come from? It was two angels walking around them with flaming swords in their hand. These guys was massive. They were huge. I said, my God, no wonder they couldn't do nothing. No wonder they couldn't do nothing. And I was standing there looking at these angels. They were protecting them. They was going to the left side of them and the right side of them, up this way. They were nonstop walking around these brothers, nonstop as these brothers was ministering to people on the street, nonstop big. These dudes, man, they was about eight feet tall and four feet wide. Whoa. They were big. <laughs> and... I said, wow. So I, I went back into my flesh and was still spiritual, looking at me like, told you so. And then I was like, what in the world? What can, What is that power that these guys working to? So I said to myself, I must be weak. Either I'm weak or these things are extra strong. But I didn't want to. I still, after seeing God sent his angels, I still didn't want to be anything to do with God. I was I was I was evil and I enjoyed being evil. I enjoyed being evil. And I really didn't like it, but I enjoyed it. I mean liking is one thing, but enjoying the benefits what I'm saying. You know, I, I really wasn't a bad person. Like I said, I fed the hungry, I took care of the prostitutes, I took care of children and stuff like that. They didn't have stuff. I fed them and I did everything, but when it came down to casting a spell on somebody, especially if he made me mad when I was walking down the community, there was this man. He was yelling, here come that witch boy. Here come that witch boy. Here he come. And when I get to the middle of the block, every all the children that would be outside playing, they were all, it would be a 100 of them, seemed like. And every last one of those 100 children and their parents at that park, they would be all gone within five minutes. Everybody would be gone, leave me standing there by myself. Because the one man would announce, they would be looking for me coming, and he said, here come the, he come me the witch boy. 
He said, here come the witch boy. The witch boy is coming. And they were running the house and shut the doors, leave me outside by myself. So one day, I said, okay, I'm going to put a curse on this guy. I'm going to put a curse on him. He's talking about a curse and an affliction. I said, I'm going to curse him, but I'm going to hit him without hitting him. I'm going to hit his son, his son, Junior, named after him. So I pronounced a curse, which I won't say what kind it was over the air. I pronounced a curse dealing with, uh, I'm going to say it was, uh, it's found, the opposite of it is found in, in Zechariah 2 and 2. It's called the highway spirit. I said, I send the highway spirit after Asmodai, that's all I'm going to say, after him, not to kill him, but just to get back at, at them. And I felt that spirit leave from my presence, go quickly down to where he was, get inside of a car, make the person inside the car run his son over, and his son and the bike flew 75 feet through the air but didn't die as a warning, as a warning. And I said, I cursed, I cursed you. And your son, not your daughters, not your wife, just you. And I let him know, do not mess with me. And after that, he never said a word. He seen me coming, the grown man, he would run. But when I try that on those Williams brothers, I mean, those Davis brothers, nothing. But an unprotected person is easy. Now, when we talk about people in the church that's not really living right towards God, that's coming in and coming out, coming in and coming out, playing games and talking. Like the book of Deuteronomy says, if you do this, I will bless you. But if you don't do this and you walk on cherry, you're going to reap the benefits of that too, if that's a benefit. You're going to walk under a curse. And that's why I tell people that's doing this and they're wondering how come these things are happening is because you're opening the door yourself. A, a witch, a witch. And I wasn't like my father. He was voodoo. I was just normal voodoo. And, but I wasn't a weakling. And I tried my very best, Shannon. I tried my best to hurt those two brothers with everything I could. I learned, I learned, I learned on both sides that the power through those big angels had could, could protect God's people because God sent them. But the problem, you know, the problem is with the Davis brothers is that they backslid uh -oh. and they came back into the world with smoking and drinking. And I was more mad at them. I was more angry at them, Brother Shannon, from coming back in the world with me than I was when they left me in the first place. Because I said, why would you come back out here in these streets when you had more power than my father and myself put together? Why would you come back? Because here's the here's the thing. Here's the thing. And a lot of church folks may get upset when I say this. A lot of pastors may. I love you, brothers and sisters. But I got to tell you the truth. A lot of them not teaching the, the body of Christ what they need to know about the invisible realm. So those brothers really didn't know that they had powerful angels on their side that was protecting them against an evil person of myself. And why would they come back? Because they probably were not taught to really enjoy the real benefits of being a real spirit-filled Christian. Man, it's so powerful. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light.